All right. Hello and welcome to the second episode in our Mission Critical webinar series. Mission Critical, presented by CIM Magazine and SGS Natural Resources, is focused on the development of Canada's store of critical minerals. David Inanichuk, VP of Metallurgy and Consulting at SGS, and I, CIM Magazine editor Ryan Bergen, will bring in industry leaders to deal with your practical, political, and financial questions around what it will take to make good on the generational opportunity represented by the decarbonization and electrification of our economy. Now, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, to ensure you have optimal audio, make sure that you are using your computer, computer audio, that the button for computer audio is selected on your control panel. Uh, if you dialed in on your phone, ensure the phone button is selected. And if you have any questions during the discussion, please type into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, and please give them a proofread um, so we can be sure that we don't garble them. Uh, all right then. So with that, let's uh, let's begin. Uh, the shift to battery electric vehicles has boosted the demand for critical minerals. As the early generations of these vehicles begin to reach the end of their lives, they will become a vital and essential source of materials for future battery production. In this episode, we will explore the background and outlook for the recycling market, the economics and business model behind it, some questions around the sourcing of material and the chemistry of recycling, as well as the role of government and how the supply chain might be built out. Uh, so let me bring in my co-host. Thank you again, David, for joining us today and for your help in bringing this discussion together. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Look forward to, uh, like I said, our second episode of the of the uh, Mission Critical series. So, and of course, um, this you know this is an exciting topic. So we don't uh, often talk enough about recycling. So it's great to have our, our panelists uh, here today. Great. And so yes, for our panelists, let's first uh, introduce Sean DeVries. The Executive Director of the Battery Metals Association of Canada, a nonprofit industry association representing all segments of the circular battery value chain. Prior to joining the Battery Metals Association of Canada, Sean had a variety of experience in the end of life electronics sector, helping to develop and implement industry led producer responsibility programs across Canada and overseeing the development and implementation of internationally recognized electronics reuse and recycling standards, audits, and certification processes. Thanks so much for being here, Sean. And we also have uh, Niels Verban, who is Director, Technical Services uh, Hydrometallurgy for Metallurgy and Consulting at SGS Natural Resources. Uh, Niels has authored a co co-author well over 40 technical publications and two patents related to the processing of critical materials. He's also currently chair for the Joe Ferron uh, Memorial Symposium Processing of Critical Materials as part of the Conference of Metallurgists that's coming up in Halifax later this year. And finally, we have Mark uh, Trivisil, who is a professional engineer and has been in the mining and processing business for over 30 years. Uh, most of his career with Falcon Bridge. Uh, Mark joined Falcon Bridge in 1988. He was former site manager of Northern Sun Mining from 2014 to 2019, and later in 2020 joined Electra Battery Materials, formerly known as First Cobalt, as its uh, VP of Project Development. Okay, uh, so thank you all, gentlemen, for joining us here today. Uh, now, David, I'm going to pass it off to you. Uh, to just get us started on a little bit about the uh, recycling market, uh, the outlook, and, and the background. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, I mean, wh the question is, why is recycling an interesting topic? And in order to meet the long-term battery raw materials supply challenge, um, to, to meet those net zero goals as we you know, think about the long-term in 2050, uh, mining is not going to be it's not going to bring enough units to the market and um, this is a, a chart of some of you have seen it from from benchmark where you know the message is hey recycling is going to play a big part of the market supply um, like I said in in the decades forward so again and we don't to me sometimes we don't talk uh, enough about recycling um, so like I said uh, that's why when we want to get some, like I said some views on this and so maybe this is a good place to start with you, Mark. 
look, we, we've been following Electra Battery Materials journey. We've seen the company move to constructing North America's only cobalt uh, um, sulfate refinery, which will be in Ontario. Um, you know, like I said, we, we've seen the company expand its vision, but um, it's not just about that. It's also Electra started uh, looking at black mass recycling. You guys started a trial late 22. Um, and in fact, you did ship uh, your first customer shipment of nickel cobalt in 23. So maybe you could tell us, Mark, um, you know, why is Electra moved into battery recycling and not just the, you know, refining um, of products? Okay, I can I can touch on that, and thanks for having me. Um, I, I guess this all started when you know when we started to to put together the package for the the cobalt sulfate plant, and making presentations to um, automotive manufacturers. Uh, our vision of what we've seen on the cobalt sulfate supply side. Um, it was many times during those presentations that. They were asking us what we're doing on recycling, and and these questions, you know, from our standpoint, were coming from senior levels of management, if not the board level, uh, at places like Ford and GM and, and big manufacturers. You know, what what are we going to do to get recycled products in into our our final product? Uh, so there was that push, and then there was there was also, you know, we were sitting on an asset. Uh, that was uh, operated as a hydrometallurgical site uh, that produced uh, cobalt and nickel products through uh, hydrometallurgical processes. Uh, so there was the opportunity there to utilize some of the existing systems and processes in place to start taking uh, things like black mass and, and seeing what we can, uh, you know, if we can profitably uh, uh, put the, the metals through the process and make some money out of it. So, so there are a couple things uh, that 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 pushed us in, in that direction, um, and uh, you know, as you mentioned, within the last year, we've managed to process, you know, about 40 to 50 tons of black mass, and and we've sold our products into the market. But we've learned a lot um, along the way. Um, some of those things, those learnings, I'll, I'll share with you uh, as I get prompted for the for the. Uh, um, for the questions, but um, uh, you know, it's it's in short, the market uh, is very very dynamic. There's lots of things going on in the recycling, market. you know, from control of the supply of scrap batteries, end of life batteries, uh, to the production of black mass, and then the processing of that black mass into refined products. Uh, there's there's a lot of nodes uh, in the in the chain here that uh, can get pretty complex, uh, and understanding those over the last well over the last one to two years we we've certainly at Electra have got a really good sense of you know where we would fit into the market and potentially where there needs to be some change in the market um, as well as you know a real good ideas you know how the economics work to, to make money for this. So I, I think we, we, it's well-traveled uh, ground, certainly in, in, in CIM circle about, I guess, the um, critical minerals in the ground. But um, what, is the, what is the opportunity within Canada and, and in the wider North America uh, for you know, the recycling market? What, what sort of volume, what's the scale of this? Um, and, 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 also, I guess the, the, the kind of competition that, that you have with, with other uh, regions like, like Asia, black mass producers. Yeah, I, I think in, in the near term, uh, uh, you're, you're not seeing the, the, certainly the supply of scrap, certainly from the electric vehicle uh, battery manufacturers that everyone had thought we would be three or four years ago in, in uh, right now. Uh, the, the, uh, electric vehicle supply just hasn't been uh, all that robust and um, you know the uh, production of um, batteries in North America you know has really just started and and by the way that's that's the majority of the source of the scrap and the recycling is is a, is a manufacturing uh, the manufacturing scrap. Um, 
uh, whether it's the cell itself or uh, the modules as they're being assembled to be part of the electric vehicle. Uh, like that's that's a significant part of this. In fact, I got a little I got a little uh, uh, piece of information for you. Uh, an Asian tier one battery producer. So this is this is a group that's been producing these types of batteries for over 25 years. Uh, they still have four to six percent of their manufacturing uh, scrap um, as as cell scrap. So that's that's still that's still that's very high. So you can see what's going to feed this. It's going to be that, um, that 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 type of supply. Um, so I, I you know getting getting partnered with you know an, an OEM that is you know, making the cell and then also partnering with even the uh, uh, the electric vehicle manufacturer that is assembling it into a module. Like those are key, two key steps in the recycling market. And 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 if and if you can do that, and we're and Electro, we're we're in the middle of doing that with. Uh, a group in southwestern Ontario called Three Fires. Uh, so that's that's a real. You know, it's, it's basically securing your supply, right, of of, of recycled scrap, uh, and and that's that's a big part of the equation going forward. Um, some of the challenges that I've seen is that, and I guess I'm going to jump into the government here. But some of the challenges that I've seen on the economic side is that there's nothing preventing right now people who recycle and make a black mass product from shipping that product overseas to be refined and shipping that product to Asia to be refined, which kind of it's, it's the paradox here because our, our governments are pumping billions into critical metal supply you know um and and want to you know and encouraging investment in, in into mines and, and processing facilities on the critical metal side and then on the recycling side which you show on your graph there 40 percent of it is like some of that stuff right now is going overseas and is ending up in markets like china because they're they're you know there's there's no regulatory uh Frame, framework to prevent that from happening. So, you know, you, you, the government is going to put money into developing nickel and cobalt and lithium over here. We're going to make batteries out of it. And then those scrap batteries could end up back in Asia. So, and, 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 and Mark, there's a good time to jump into some of the history within North America for recycling industries because we have seen other, not, not with respect to lithium ion batteries, but other um, materials are being recycled in terms of um, them being shipped over overseas from um, North America to China. We have seen, you know, things come up to kind of try to prevent that, you know, based on regulatory policy historically. And, and Sean, this is a, a good part to maybe move to you to get your um, some feedback from you because both of you and I have been in, involved in the recycling industry for for a while prior to lithium ion batteries, you know, especially when it was electronic circuit boards and the end of life, um, uh, like I said, uh, electronics, like printers, fax machines, uh, because obviously you can recover the precious metals, the PGMs, the copper in them. Um, and even myself, when we were recycling uh, L uh, before LED TVs, there were uh, cathode, ray cathode ray tubes from the old TVs that were going to uh, Beldune Smelter when back when it was uh, Noranda. This was in New Brunswick. So, Sean, can you maybe just talk about um, some of that infrastructure that was developed from other recycling industries, and what lessons have we learned from electronics that we could apply to batteries today? Yeah, thanks, David. I mean, it's been uh, over 20 years now. It's kind of hard to believe when we started off trying to set up electronics recycling programs in Canada, and at that time, the the industry was really at nascent stages. There was already existing battery recycling happening in some 
specific areas and, and specific types, but a, a very nascent industry as well. And so I think it's the electronics recycling and, and those programs came about as a result of some of this uh, regulatory um, push as, as you've indicated. And so that helped really spark the boom of the industry and, and developing the uh, processing technologies. And so in the early days, as you indicate, we really looked to like the smelters, for instance, um, these electronic products could be, you know, uh, recovered through the smelters and, um, you know, just like any other, uh, other raw material that goes into them. But the challenge is we've got some really complex products going in. Uh, the, the, the whole TV doesn't necessarily uh, or can't necessarily be recovered through one single process. And so we have to start to do that process of dividing these things up, getting circuit boards and getting them to the right processor, to the right smelter so that you can get, recover the copper, the leaded glass to the lead smelter for the lead. So you start to see this need to have these specific or specified technologies for recovery. And that started to develop and, and really that's the same thing, the challenge that we're having now we're facing with batteries. We have these different chemistries of batteries that really need to be uh, recovered in specific ways now uh, so that we can get the materials out of them. And, and it's a bit of a move from, we, we wanna not look at this as we're trying to deal with the waste that, at the end of life, but what we're trying to do is recover those valuable materials that are in them. And so it needs some specific processes that you know, companies like um, Electra are building out. So there's there's some upfront processing that naturally happens when you know you get a battery pack in and it has to be broken down and separated out and wires and cables removed and things like that. And then it goes through a shredding process. And so a lot of that is based on that existing uh, uh, infrastructure that's already in place. And for batteries, for instance, their EV batteries are going down the same processing line as batteries from your phone and your computer and, and how those are currently being processed. So the real trick is on these uh, next step processes of recovery through the, 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 you know, the black mass and trying to get those materials out. So we're getting mu as much of that value from the, the batteries as possible. So we see several companies and several technologies in Canada that have been leading on that from Recyclico, uh, Lifecycle, Lithion, Electra. So we, we have a lot of opportunity here in Canada and organizations that are working on that. Good, good. Um, so maybe we can uh, bring uh, Niels in a bit on this conversation. Um, and you, know, you touched on a bit, Sean, uh, just about uh, what it takes, and here we can, I guess, focus on lithium ion batteries, uh, the process of recycling, of, of recovering what is a, a big block of, uh, of a battery and, and turning it into, um, something that can be uh, recovered for, for, for future reuse. Um, so could you maybe take us through the basics? Uh, sure, thanks uh, Thanks for the question, uh, uh, Ryan. Uh, first of all, the composition that we see here on the screen looks like a, uh, a black mass from an NCM type style uh, battery. And, and traditionally our clients have focused on the recovery of cobalt and nickel first. Uh, but the manganese, lithium, uh, and graphite are also of, uh, uh, of, uh, of importance. Certainly, with the current low lithium prices, the focus really has to be on the uh, on, on the cobalt and nickel. Um, you know, with respect to processing this material, there's a variety of processes out there, that, uh, and a few have been mentioned already just uh, just now by Sean. Uh, I've uh, sometimes heard or used the term that's a bit of the wild west out there in, uh, in, in, in terms of the different types of flow sheets that are out there treating actually relatively similar uh, materials. And, and I, I think you can say that, you know, roughly you could divide these type of flow sheets into maybe call it two main types, flow sheets that uh, uh, treat this black mass and separate it into nickel and or separate it, uh, nickel and cobalt and manganese uh, lithium streams, uh, or flow sheets that produce some sort of mixed metal stream. Uh, so mixed nickel, cobalt, manganese separate from the lithium. Uh, now, without trying to get into the nitty gritty here, that the, the actual hydrometallurgical processes uh, usually. Uh, and I'm, I'm ignoring a bit the pyramid route here, uh, which really the Vumicar is, is a main route, but me as a hydrometallurgist will focus on 
what I know of. Uh, so the typical process is that it will start with some sort of reductive leach impurity removal, uh, and you're dealing with different types of impurities. And then uh, if we're going to go into separated metals, uh, usually some sort of sequential solvent extraction process to go after the manganese, cobalt, nickel, uh, uh, and lithium, crystallize the metal salts as some sort of sulfate or nitrate. Uh, deal with the sodium uh, and the reagents that you've added into your metallurgical process and make some sort of lithium carbonate uh, a product. The alternative is that you make a mixed metal hydroxide or sulfate uh, 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 product. And maybe I'll leave it at that before I really get too far into the nitty gritty here. Yeah, All no, right. th thanks, Thank Neil. Um, yeah, just to comment that if you know when you're looking at designing your recycling process, it really depends on the business model because different companies have different interests. Are you a project owner that has your own IP in terms of your views on developing a process flow sheet? Are you a chemical company who's also interested in re recycling, but you want to sell your reagents as as part of that, right? As part of that business model and provide services. But are you an automotive company who wants to invest in recycling? Are you a trading company who's interested in the offtake? So everyone has a different role um, when it comes to looking at, uh, like I said, these uh, recycling flow sheets, um, and it doesn't impact your design. So there's a few things to consider, right? Are are you going to first look at maximizing the economics? Are you going to try to maximize your recycling rate? And also there's the the you know concept of, hey, I want to also create a low carbon footprint for that process. So Niels, you did mention, uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, intermediate products. Maybe can you just comment a bit, what's the difference in a flow sheet when you're looking at producing a highly refined chemical versus some uh, mixed intermediate product? Can you maybe just talk a little bit about that and maybe clarify what, what would be the difference um, at the end of the flow sheet between the two? Yeah, so... The difference at, at the end of the flow sheet, a mixed metal product, uh, we've sometimes called this an MHP, mixed hydroxide precipitate, and certainly those from the uh, uh, nickel laterite industry will be very familiar with that technique. Um, and it, it's, it's a good question, David. Uh, and uh, oh, people that know me know that, have, uh, that I've got a, a bit of a background in metal recycling. And uh, so and as a metallurgist, and, and that's where my opinion comes from. So as a metallurgist, with a bit of a recycling background, I was always taught that, you know, if, if you don't control your feed material, uh, the ability to produce high purity chemicals, because that's really what we're making here. We're making, uh, you know, these are chemical plants. So the ability to produce high purity chemicals, such as metal sulfates or, uh, uh, or metal nitrates, is somewhat out of your control. Uh, so therefore, I think, uh, and that's a bit of my personal opinion, the production of some sort of intermediate uh, product, call it an MHP or, or, or something else. With a and what is MHP step. for those who aren't familiar with that acronym? Uh, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's a mixed hydroxide precipitate. Uh, and so usually a combination of cobalt, nickel. I think in, in the, uh, as we're talking about these type of NCM uh, uh, derived black mass products, you know, manganese would be grouped within this, uh, this product as well. So the, the production of some sort of intermediate uh, 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 product may make good sense to de-risk your project a bit more. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. And Mark, maybe this is a good time to talk about what is your approach at Electra in terms of, we, you know, I know you have a proprietary process in terms of what you've developed. So maybe can you kind of comment on how you guys approach uh, that that uh, you know that process design. Yeah, I, certainly. Um, and uh, you know the MHP is is what we're selling right now. We're we're making a a nickel cobalt uh, precipitate, and we're selling that as an intermediate product. But it, it goes back to uh, you know we started this because we had an asset that we wanted to utilize. You know. Uh, we had the leaching vessels. We we had the solid liquid, uh, uh, you know, filter presses. You know, we 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 had we had all that equipment, uh, and and we wanted to piggyback on that asset. So you know what 
kind of we tried to fit the process with the asset we had. Um, so that's that's kind of how we ended up where we did, and and you know in doing so, we probably only spent a few million dollars to generate these products, where our competition has had to spend tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars to 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 get to where we we are at, at this point. Um, but I you know again learning a little bit about the market about how this whole thing is evolving, um, you got to go back to controlling the feed, controlling the scrap, and having having uh, for for it to be economically sound uh, or call it robust. You, you've you've got to either partner with a scrap supplier uh, or um, you know be part of that of that collection phase to produce uh, a black mass product. Right now, if you're producing a black mass product in North America, uh, the majority of the revenue you have captured, right? So there's not a lot of the pie left to the processors of black mass, unless you're gonna take it all the way through to PCAM, you know, and, and to CAM. Then, then the margins are there. But that could change. That's why I go back to the government again. That could change if the government says, you know, that 40% that you have uh, on the recycle pie chart there, yeah. the government says that's got to stay in North America. That's part of our core metal inventory, we'll call it, that has to stay and get recycled in North America and not and not sent overseas. The Europeans have been doing this. The Europeans have been doing this. They they, they figured this out a long time ago, and 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 they they you know they're uh, black mass can't be shipped outside of the uh, the European Union. And Mark, uh, I think as uh, security supply issues heat up, and they will heat up in the future, yeah. um, I think that will come back to North America, whether that's Canada and U.S. to kind of put a stance on that because. Um, I'm sure the OEMs will be screaming if there are issues with getting supply in the future, and it will come back through policy at some point. So, yeah. um, anyways, Ryan, maybe let's turn it back to yeah. you to Thanks. move to the next yeah. section here to, to keep Beautiful. on time. <laughs> um, yeah, so we just want to uh, talk a bit about um, material streams and chemistries. Um, and I know, David, you got a great chart about, you know, so where the, the material for recycling uh, comes from. It's, uh, from production scrap um, or end of life material and how over time uh, that will change. Um, so, so a question um, to whomever wants it to, I guess, field it first, uh, what, what is the impact of recycling feed coming from production scrap versus end of life uh, feed? End of life being like batteries whose, who's, um, I guess, useful lives uh, have been, uh, are over. And I'll, I'll jump in here for just a, a sec here, Ryan, um, just to talk about the chart. You know, it, analysts are, are telling us that, look, in the short term, it's all production scrap. That's the light blue line in the chart. Um, and that's what a lot of, that's what, we, you know, Mark, you were talking about, you know, aligning with OEMs from that perspective. And what I've heard at conferences, you know, they're saying, look, today, scrap, production scrap rates are as high as 20% because some of these OEMs, it's early days for producing, you know, EVs or in, in the, you know, in that whole manufacturing process, um, they're targeting to get down to 10% scrap rates. And in the long term, they're hoping they can get down to five. But hey, that means there's still lots of material available. The end of life um, vehicles coming out of service because we, you know, they want these battery packs to last 10, 15, 20 years. We're only going to see that volume end of decade, right? So uh, going back to Mark, right? How do, how do you prepare when you guys do your trials? Um, your plant trials, how, how do you prepare for um, these different market needs when you talk about the different partners uh, you're working with? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if you're a black mass processor, you know, you're you're kind of, you're handcuffed with whatever the chemistry is, is fed to you. you. You try to work with a supplier to say, you know, can you, you know, I like this range 
nickel. I'd like this range of cobalt. I'd like this range of impurities. Uh, but um, you know, as a you know, as a receiver of black metal, sometimes you, you you just gotta process what you get. Um, this is this is part of the reason for you know trying to to twin up with uh, um, you know a, a cell manufacturer or uh, you know an, an automobile manufacturer of electric vehicles that you can you know the the, the chemistry will be more uh, consistent and uh, as as what uh, Nels was saying earlier you know try to try to make the you know try to make as as good a product as you can but you, you know you're you've got to have your inputs uh fixed so that so that you know the variation in your processes are are minimal um i mean that's 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 the best thing that i, I can tell you is that you know we've we've tried to make a robust system and uh you know the the products that we're selling you know aren't battery grade currently uh but um you know to get to that higher level of battery grade on the recycling side you, you certainly do uh, you know you, you got to put in uh, the uh, the extra you know sx uh, cells you got to put in the the extra the uh, you know residue handling system filtration system to get that and that, that's all capital and then you, and then you wonder at the end of the day you know after you do the calculation is it worth based on based on what the market is yeah, and I could see there's room, you know, like I said, the, and we'll talk about chemistries in a moment, but because, um, yeah, things will change over time, no doubt. And and Niels, I mean, I guess asking the similar question, you have a lot of different clients. Uh, you know, we mentioned there's different clients with different interests when they're um, looking at developing these, you know, extraction routes and, and process flow sheets. So how does that approach your, um, when you look at wor working on projects with your clients, how, how does that impact yeah. things? Maybe I'll just make a comment on the differences between scrap material and end-of-life material. Uh, and, uh, and one thing I think that hasn't been said here is that it, it's important to know that scrap recycling involves the reprocessing of materials that were produced, I don't know, today, yesterday. Uh, it's today's chemistry. Uh, 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 I think both Sean and Mark said earlier that no, this, this, this is a dynamic market. Uh, quantities and compositions of the battery materials are changing rapidly. Uh, you know, we, we know that. So scrap material means it's the reprocessing of today's chemistries. You, you, you could argue that uh, reprocessing such material is uh, considered, uh, I don't want to say easier, uh, but maybe just less difficult. So when you're talking about end of life, material we're dealing with chemistries that were produced i don't know eight nine ten or more years ago and, and just by definition we know that those chemistries are significantly different so if you want to reprocess that back into the current uh, battery chemical producers that means that you're going to have to uh, uh, separate these into its individual uh, components and, and 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 use the solvent extraction cells that Mark uh, uh, just mentioned, uh, and that uh, uh, provides uh, or, or leads to a, you know an additional degree of difficulty. So I think those are some of the changes or differences that are important to point out when you talk about scrap versus end of life uh, 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 materials. So understanding your client and where they're coming from and how they're situated, uh, uh, you know, leads to different recommendations to our clients there. And uh, Sean, do you want to kind of add some comments? Because there are parallels here to, like I said, electronics, different chemistries, um, and different points of, uh, like I said, when, when this is coming into supply chain. Yeah, and I think the different chemistries is the biggest thing because, again, that's what we see with electronics. You have this whole host of different chemistries that can come back, and they all re require their own unique process to recover those materials. And so now we're talking largely about nickel-based batteries, which take up most of the market. But very soon, and I think in China, the number is about 50% now of batteries that are lithium iron phosphate. And so we're taking now a completely different battery chemistry and adding that to the mix. So not only are they going to need to be processed differently, but this causes those challenges of the unknown when they're coming back. Are they properly labeled? Do you know what's coming in as, as your input material stream? And uh, you're separating them out before they get into that mix to cause you additional problems. 
Yeah, and Sean, there are you know legislation or regulatory policies. You're talking about transport of materials. Um, you know, so there's all sorts of things that come up. So this, this is a good time for us to move into the battery chemistry discussion. <clears throat> you know, if we look at, we, we've seen all these, you know, high nickel batteries as one part of the market. Um, and ob obviously that means sort of they're looking at lower amounts of cobalt over time. We show that in the, the chemistry slide um, as an example, some of the changing chemistries. Um, and, and we know that the high nickel batteries is for, you know, that higher, that longer distances in electric vehicles, more power associated with nickel. But then you mentioned, Sean, LFP. So, you know, analysts um, are forecasting, hey, that's going to be a significant part of the market. Um, and yet we don't, you know, we're only beginning to talk about LFP. Well, a lot of the discussion is around, the, like I said, these high nickel batteries. So that brings us to, you know, hey, there's a lot of variability to feed. How's, how does this affect projects? So um, going back to Niels, you know, how, how do you handle that? Um, continuing com kind of what we mentioned before, what are the inherent risks? You know, um, and also these are not mineral deposits either, right? If you're comparing it to, to mines where you have kind of steady feed, um, just looking at the mix of chemistries here. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, these are not mineral deposits, uh, uh, David. But I bet that Mark has the same question that, uh, that any other uh, processor of a, a primary ore deposit has. And that is, what does it cost to build my plant? What does it cost to operate the plant? So CapEx, OpEx, what's the metallurgical performance? Uh, what's the recovery? What's the grade of the product that I make? What's the, my reagent consumption? All of these things feed into uh, a financial model. So where this, this may not be a mineral uh, uh, deposit, we have the same questions. Uh, and to answer these questions, you're gonna need to get into test work. Now, you, you spoke about uh, uh, ore variability. And, and again, I, I'm gonna draw into our experience with uh, handling mineral de uh, deposits. So when you've got an ore deposit in the ground, you, you have the luxury to drill your deposit and figure out what you're gonna process in years uh, I don't know, 1 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, uh, 15 to 20. And you can design your test work and make sure that uh, uh, your metallurgical plant is able to treat this uh, material and that you're able to predict what's the plant performance of, uh, of, of that uh, uh, later year samples. But how does this work for the battery recyclers, uh, right? I, I think I heard Mark say uh, earlier, uh, you know, you know, you're gonna kind of have to treat uh, uh, what you get. Uh, you know, if I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mark, but uh, hey, you get what you get and you don't get upset. We sometimes yes. use, hey, that's not what you said, I realize that. But uh, uh, that is, I think, more complicated, uh, uh, right? We know these battery chemistries are changing. Uh, if, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the flow sheets uh, that is uh, designed to recover cobalt, nickel, manganese, and lithium uh, will struggle with processing uh, some sort of black mass material coming from an LFP material, uh, right? It doesn't make sense. Uh, so this is complicated. How can you solve this or how can you uh, further de-risk this? Uh, uh, keep your uh, a process flow sheet as simple as possible. Possibly don't aim to get into final uh, uh, finished high end products and getting your hands on different types of batteries uh, and the black mass materials is certainly recommended. Trying to predict how, how, how robust your flow sheet is and, uh, and, how, and how it can handle the various changes is really important. And Mark, you know, when you're going back to your process, you made some comments on capital decisions you have to make, and I'm sure it's the same thing for your OPEX when you're designing you know, the flow sheet, but how flexible do you want to be when it comes to these chemistries? Well, I mean, Ideally, you, you want to be able to take any of the nickel, manganese, cobalt batteries, um, especially at our plant. Um, and, and again, hooking up with, you know, again, going back, get try to get relationships with the with suppliers that you can get constant feed. And and with that not being so, sometimes uh, I mean, it's not new technology in in smelters that. You know uh, that have uh, blending facilities. You know, like where you blend concentrates 
uh, to feed smelters. You can you can blend uh, black mass um, in different black mass supply uh, to to do the same thing. But that you know that's capital. You know you got to you got to put a small blending facility up front and and uh, mix the black mass uh, chemistries together to to try and uh, have less of a variation in your in your feed kit. Um, so you know things like that. Um, but you know what we've seen uh, certainly is uh, you know the, the the leaching and and um, leaching and precipitation stages have been fairly robust from what we've saw because we have we had taken different black mass feeds. Um, but the uh, the real money in this business is going to be going downstream like nelson said you know like you make make as high a grade material as you can because that's where the money is you know uh and, and you then you're not you're not uh, i'm going to say bowing to the, uh, the smelters as much on on the payables and, and you know you the finished product that you can get uh, london metal exchange prices for and and maybe Niels, um, I'll, this will be a quick one, so we can move to the next um, section. But I just want to ask you, when you're de designing or developing these process flow sheets, can you just comment on the importance of pilot plants um, to deal with, like I said, these you know different chemistries? How, how does that help de-risk your project? Yeah, that's a that's a topic near to my heart, uh, uh, David, and a conversation we have with our clients frequently, uh, uh, and. Uh, I'm trying to keep it short here. Uh, uh, I, I, I guess the short answer here is that piloting is required to confirm your metallurgical performance. Whatever you've developed at the lab scale, the uh, bench scale test, you've got to confirm this under continuous conditions. And metallurgical performance means recovery, grade, reagent consumption. Those three items are, are key. Pilot plan is also important to observe the operability of your flow sheet. Huh? How robust is your flow sheet to uh, uh, changes, changes in feed or, or, or conditions and the ability to maintain that metallurgical performance. And then uh, 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 finally, I think it's important to comment on that you want to see what happens to impurities. Uh, 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 different batteries have different impurities. Uh, do they build up somewhere in the flow sheet? Uh, and uh, particularly when certain process streams are recycled. Those are some of the primary objectives uh, that uh, 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 they come into play when we talk about pilot plants. Uh, I can talk for hours more about that, but I don't think we've got the time, David. So I'll uh, throw it back yeah, to you. Yeah, it's a whole other webinar. <laughs> Ryan, it is, actually. Um, turn it over to you. Yeah, so I mean, we we uh, we touched out it uh, right out of the gate with Mark on the role of government. I think in in uh, just the flow of materials, um, but that's not I think the only uh, potentially the only role. Uh, that government may have both in, in uh, uh, whether it's building up the supply chain or helping uh, companies de-risk uh, their, their really stage projects. Um, so, yeah, David, you had a question about. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, Mark. I mean, you were the, you definitely touched on it throughout. You know, what what is the role that the government needs to play um, by building out this whole EV battery recycling industry, whether it's Canada or even North America. 